How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good. My name is Ron Mueller. Um, I'm an elder here at Freedom Bible Church. Um, <clears throat> uh, Pastor Frank is taking some time off to recharge and rejuvenate. You know, it's good for him to do that in the summer. You know, I would put up being a pastor is probably the hardest job there is, really, dealing with people and the things that he has to see and do. It, it's really tough. Um, so we elders get to come up here and, and preach the word. Um, one of the things that comes with that, of course, is the, the knowledge that spiritual warfare is alive and well. Because during the week, anybody that has to come up here would attest that spiritual warfare comes at us. Um, in the past, I've had many things, weird things happen in the middle of the night. You know, one night, one, one time before a sermon, my uh, waterbed popped uh, in the middle of the night. Me and my wife were dealing with that. Then another, another time, our AC went out. We were dealing with that. So anything to distract you from the word. And this week was no different. However, you know, I think my wife, she has sermon week PTSD. Because she was looking at me with some concerned eyes yesterday about what's going to hit us today. You know, and luckily we're fine. We've made it here, you know, and everything's good. So anyway, as many of you know, Pastor Frank pours his heart and soul into this ministry. He has a true pastor's heart. And one of the things that I love is that he centers everything around exalting God and his word. Um, I've been coming to freedom since about 2006. Well, actually 2006. Eric talked about last week how he had a drug problem. And um, because his mom drug him to church. Well, I had the same drug problem, I guess, because my wife drugged me to church as well. But anyway, coming to freedom really was my first real experience with being at a church that exalted God and preached his word. And I'll never forget my first time. You know, I probably heard more scripture in that one sermon than I had heard in my entire life. Um, and Frank was real with everything. I mean, he, he keeps it real. He likes, he's vulnerable. He'll tell you his story, all those things. And that really helped me. Um, it wasn't just a bunch of religious stuff. Um, then he used this illustration I'll never forget. He said one time he was approached by somebody on the outside and they said, hey, do you realize you got a bunch of hypocrites in your church? And he said, Sure. I feel like old McDonald up here. There's a hypocrite, here's a hypocrite, everywhere a hypocrite, hypocrite. And I just was, I, I died laughing. I thought that was so funny. And it, it, it just, it was great. And what he said in that sermon that day made a lot of sense to me. It really opened my heart. And I was drawn to give my life to Jesus, and I did. And actually, every Sunday after that for a while, I was asking for Jesus to come into my heart. Because I wasn't sure it stuck. I was waiting for something to happen. I even met with Pastor Frank and, you know, talked about it with him. And he was like, you know, I asked him, like, when will I know? When will I know that I'm actually really saved? He goes, you'll know. Just give it time, you'll know. And man, was he right. I mean, over time, I, I saw the, the process of me being sanctified and becoming closer to Jesus. And my life was changed forever. And it hasn't been perfect, of course. I mean, there's been hills and valleys, hills and valleys. I mean, uh, ups and downs, you know. And I'm still a sinful man, saved by grace. But what's great is that I can see that trajectory going upward. And that's the big part of it, you know. It's knowing that the Holy Spirit is guiding me and sanctifying me as I go along. So here at Freedom, we center everything on exalting God and his word. Psalm 138.2 says, I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name 
and your word. Exalting God and teaching his word has to be at the center of our worship. And that's what I named my sermon today is, is the center of worship. Now, when we were in the process of purchasing this building, I got to take a tour in here to take a look at it. And as I walked into the worship center, I looked and I was in awe because I just saw what the possibilities were for this building for our ministry. It was amazing what God had provided us. You know, I'd been there since 2006. We were in the little building in Sable Street in Port Charlotte. Then we were in the cultural center for a long period of time. But now we had this building of our own and we could do so many things to spread the gospel. And it was awesome. But if something else got my attention as well, I saw those stained glass windows. And I was just like, those are awesome. Those are amazing. They're, they're, they're beautiful, these stained glass windows. And, and now that we've done some refurbishing and the painting and all that kind of stuff in here, they really contrast with the grays, the blacks, and the whites in here. They really stand out, and they look good. And my eyes were always kind of focused on them. But far more than just the aesthetics of them, what really interests me was the stories behind each image. Like, I was like, what, are they, what were the people that created these trying to tell us? What, what kind of story is behind them? So that's what I kind of want to go over today, is just kind of go through each one of those to kind of describe what the Scripture says about them. Um, you know, one of the first things that I noticed when I saw them is that they were telling us something in here, totally. And what I mean by that is there's a theme on each side. On that side, I believe it to mean that's God the Father, Holy Spirit, God the Son, and over here, we have the Word of God, Old and New Testament. And I think that theme is exalt God, preach His Word. And that's where I kind of came up with that. So what I'd like to do again is walk through each one of those. I'll have to preface this, though, with that this is Ron Mueller's interpretation. I did not make these windows. So what the people were actually thinking, I'm not a mind reader, but... Um, I did try to do a little history and digging, but I wasn't able to come up with anything on it. But I think that if we look closely at Scripture and we look at the images, we can come up with their meaning behind them. So let's go ahead and start out. The first one is on your right up front. I believe that to be a picture of the burning bush. Um, the story of, you know, the burning bush represents, I believe, God the Father. The story of God speaking to Moses through the burning bush is found in the book of Exodus. We don't have time to go through all of it, but I'll read a little bit from the book of, uh, from Exodus 3. So, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see God, see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So the appearance of God in the burning bush is known as a theophany. It's a visible form of God to man. Now, there are several reasons why God revealed himself out of the, out of the burning bush, but I'll give you a couple. The first one is God reveals himself as a fire, and that it's an image of his holiness. All throughout scripture, we see that fire 
represents the refining and purifying qualities of God's holiness. He is trying to reveal to Moses that he is holy. God even commands Moses that he needs to remove his sandals because even the ground that God is at is holy. So his holiness not only speaks to his supreme righteousness, but also his separateness from his creation. All right. So second, God revealed himself to Moses out of the burning bush as an image of his glory. So as Moses and the children of Israel realized after they came out of the wilderness, they noticed that God would show himself as a pillar of fire. It was a bright, glorious light, unapproachable by man. That was his glory. Today, the only way for us to come in presence of our holy God is to become holy ourselves. This is why God sent Jesus to be our Savior. He's our holiness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him, made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, God accepts us as holy, as holy as Jesus himself. Without that righteousness, we remain separate from God. So that's the burning bush. Second is window um, in the middle is the Holy Spirit. And what you see is a dove, and many of you already know that the dove represents the Holy Spirit. We find that over in the Gospels. So there are many conceptions, misconceptions about the Holy Spirit. Number one, you know, one of them is that they view the Holy Spirit as an impersonal or a mystical force. But Scripture is very clear that he is a divine person with a mind, emotions, and a will. He is God. That is the Holy Spirit. And he does many things in the lives of believers. His ministry is vast. Um, first of all, he indwells us. He seals us until the day of redemption. That's his mark on us. Um, he assists us in prayer. Romans 8.26 says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So he also comforts us in the hostile world we live in. He helps us with our sanctification. As our flesh becomes less evident, the fruit of the Spirit becomes more evident. He does much more than all of these, um, but there's one more very important role that he, that he has. If you look closely at the descending dove, you can see something that he's crashing down on. It's very subtle, but if you look closely... It's the head of a, of a serpent. If you want to put up the next slide up there, next picture. And you can see I got kind of circled in red, the, the actual two sides of the serpent's head. You can kind of see his beady little eyes, the blue eyes there. So it's very important. To, it, this, this represents a very important part of the Holy Spirit's ministry. Um. I believe it to mean what Jesus said in John 16. John 16, 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't, do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you'll see me no longer concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So he convicts the world of sin, believers and unbelievers alike. And to be convicted of sin is just the utter dreadfulness of our sin. We're convicted when we realize how much our sin dishonors our God. When King David was convicted by the Holy Spirit, he cried out, Against you, you only, have I sinned 
and done what was evil in your sight. The Holy Spirit not only convicts people of sin, but he also brings them to repentance. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to our sins, and then he also brings, uh, brings our hearts to a place where we can receive his grace. No one is saved apart from the Holy Spirit's convicting and regenerating work in our heart. So the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is alive and well in the world. There are only two possible responses to, to it, and that is receive, uh, uh, there's only two possible responses, and that is repentance or rejection. You can either repent or reject that conviction. Those that repent will receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Those that reject will be judged with the ruler of this world, Satan. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along. So next uh, image we have is back on the back uh, right, on your back uh, window on your right. We have what's open, looks like an open book with two symbols on it. And you have an uh, arrow pointing upward. I believe that this book is referring to Jesus as the word. John 1, 1 to verse 2, to 2 and verse 14 um, are some of my favorite verses in the Bible. In fact, I wrote that verse on the floor over there before the carpet was put in. Um, and so, and it's really the most theologically packed verses. So I'll read it. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. These are the foundation of John's entire gospel. What he's saying is Jesus Christ is God's incarnate son. He is God in the flesh. That's what he's saying. And the, he, and he, the Hebrews often refer to God as in the terms of his powerful word. Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. John declares that Jesus is God, and he was there at the very beginning. It's also expressed there, if you look at the symbols, those are the Greek letters Alpha, Omega, they're the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. Um, what he's saying there is that I was there at the beginning. I'll be there at the end. I'll be there for all time. Um, Jesus refers to himself as the Alpha and Omega many times in the, in the book of Revelations. In addition to the book, uh, the book and the Greek letters, we also see the arrow pointing upward. And I believe it to have possibly mean multiple things. Um, I picked out a couple of meanings that I believe it, that it represents. The first one being that um, it represents uh, Jesus' Jesus's resurrection and ascension into heaven. That's number one. Uh, Jesus' resurrection is the most important event that's occurred in history by far. It was the supreme validation of his deity. It validated the scriptures that foretold his coming and his resurrection. It is so important that if Jesus was not resurrected, we would have no salvation. There would be no savior. There would be no hope for eternal life. That's how important it is. Second Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul said, our faith would be useless and the life-giving power of the gospel would be altogether eliminated. That's how important the resurrection is. And so for us, we put our faith in Jesus Christ. The resurrection is everything. So it's very well may mean the arrow pointing upward means that. But what I found also in Scripture is that the arrow represents judgment as well. 
Psalm 7, 12 through 13 says, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. So the hard, hard truth is that for those that don't repent and put their faith in Jesus, they will be judged, and Jesus will be the judge. John 5, through 23 says, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor, honor the Father who sent him. And probably some of the most scariest verses in the Bible, Revelations 20, and I'll read that, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him, and him who was seated on it. From his, presence and from his presence and earth and sky fled away, and no, one was, no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. These are some intense verses, but they're true. They're truth. It's quite clear that for those who are, do not find their name written in the book of life, they will be judged for everything they had done in this life, and then they will be convicted, and then they will be condemned, and then thrown in the lake of fire away from God for all eternity. There's only one way to get your name in the book of life. Only one way. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ is the only way. The Bible teaches that everyone has sinned against God and no one is good apart from his work on the cross. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Remember I talked about God's holiness, his glory. We can't come in the presence of a holy God in our state. We can't see his glory. It only takes one bad sin, one, sin, one bad thought, one bad motive, keeps us separated for all, separated from him. But Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This death spoken of here is spiritual. The second death referenced here is the one spoken of in Revelation. God is just and holy, and he can't let sin go unpunished. However, there's good news. Not wishing anyone would perish, he made a way for justice to be served and to save us at the same time. But it took giving up his only son to pay our penalty for our sin. Romans 5, 8, that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Jesus took our place on the cross. He took the punishment we deserve so we could spend eternity with him. And one thing to remember is that salvation can't be earned. It's a free gift. God gave it to us. So we can't do enough religious stuff to get there. Just can't. So how do we attain that free gift? Romans 10, 9. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We must believe in our heart. heart. Not just with our mind. I mean, the scripture says even the de demons believe. They know that Jesus existed. Um, so Pastor Frank always says, which is a good illustration. A lot of people miss heaven between the distance between their head and their heart. We've got to give our heart to Jesus. We've got to be ready to make him our Lord, our Savior. And once we do that, we will have that true saving faith. 
And we should start to notice a little bit of difference. We should start to, to have a desire in our heart to do God's will. Because Scripture says that um, if we love God, we will do His will. So, and once we have that true same faith, we have peace. We have peace with God. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can't lose it. Jesus said this, John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Isn't that great news? Isn't that awesome news that we can be assured that, that we have salvation, that we'll be with God for eternity. So the arrow does mean resurrection and the arrow does mean judgment. We have to choose which one we want. We want the resurrection or we want the judgment. We must choose it. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, please don't wait. You can do it today. You know, um, just like I did on Sunday back in 2006. I poured my heart out to God. I told him I was sorry for my sin. I repented. I asked him to come to my heart. And that's all you have to do. And, and that's, that's how you become saved. So the next one is on your left back. It, you'll notice there's a open book with a sword. And the words in the book read Spiritus Gladius. So Spiritus Gladius is a Latin term that means sword of the spirit. The Apostle Paul uses that phrase in the book of Ephesians when he's talking about the full armor of God, he talks about the sword of spirit. Sword of spirit represents the word of God. The gladius is a type of sword. It was used during Roman ancient times before and after Christ walked this earth. Now the, gla the sword, the gladius was a much feared weapon in its prime, but it took skilled soldiers in wielding it to make it effective. So they had a lot of training, rigorous training on how to use the sword. Well, that's a great illustration for us with the sword of the spirit. Christians, we need to have rigorous training in the word of God so that we know how to handle the sword. Second Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The more we know and understand the word of God, the more equipped we will be able to handle our dark world. Boy, that's loud. Uh, but Jesus really is our best example when he was tempted in the wilderness. If you remember back in the Gospels when Jesus was led into the wilderness, <clears throat> Satan tried to twist the word of God and come at Egypt or come at uh, Jesus trying to tempt him. But Jesus put scripture right back on him. And he used it as not only just a, a defense, but as a blow to Satan. And that's how we need to look at it. You know, we, we have to remember we, this, you know, their spiritual, spiritual warfare is real. The only way that we can get through this world through that is through the Word of God. And so we need to read and, and study that. We have Bible studies. We have home groups. We have church, of course. Um, the men we meet on, we meet on Tuesday nights at uh, 6.30. Right now we're studying the book of Genesis. You know, we'd love to have any of you there. Just a great way to really deep, you know, deep dive into Scripture as we... Take it apart verse by verse. Next, now with the Word of God, you have the Old and New Testaments. And those are the next two windows. The one in the middle, I believe, represents the Old Testament. So what you have is a couple of tablets. Looks like there's the Ten Commandments written on it. Now, it looks to me like they're broken. There's cracks through them. Um, now, Moses... Now, I believe the tablets are going to represent Moses and Aaron. 
Moses represents the law. Aaron represents the Levitical priesthood. Now, the law and the Levitical priesthood are central to the Old Testament. Now, like I said, it appears that the tablets are broken, which leads me to a story. It's in the book of Exodus. Now, I mentioned earlier that the Israelites were being oppressed by the Egyptians. Moses and Aaron were actually uh, commissioned by God to lead the Israelites out in, out of Egypt after performing many miracles and plagues and after parting the Red Sea, they were in the wilderness. Well, they got at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses went up on a mount to get the law. While they were out there for a, for a while, waiting for Moses to come back, well, the Israelites got impatient. Probably nervous, scared, didn't know what was going on, forgot what God, God already done for them, getting them out of Egypt. They pressured Aaron into forming a, 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 a god out of gold. The god was a calf, if you remember. So Aaron had them all give them their jewelry, so he formed this calf out of the gold, and then they started worshiping it, probably asking for protection, provision, all that kind of stuff. They had forgotten what God had done. So Moses comes back down from the mount. What does he see? He sees them worshiping this, this calf. Moses gets angry, throws the tablets on the ground, they break, and, you know, that, and the whole theme of that is not just that Moses was angry, but really that they had already broken the covenant with God by forming this God. The first two commandments, Exodus 23 through 5, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So, and Moses had to intercede for the people because God was angry. He, he was angry because they broke the covenant. But God relented and ended up obtaining, and Moses ended up obtaining new tablets, which represented a renewed covenant. Aaron's failure really is as a leader, is just a demonstration of our human nature. Um, we don't know Aaron's motivation of why he did that, made the God out of the, the jewelry. But you could kind of see it. The pressure the people were probably putting on our fear, wanting to be liked, all those things probably came into play. And, and he did that. But despite his failures... God still used him as his first high priest. And the, the high priest was the highest religious person in the camp. His most important job was offering, you know, doing sin offerings. They had what was known as the tabernacle, the tent of meetings. Inside the, inside the tabernacle or tent of meetings, there was a place called the Holy of Holies. It was separated by a veil. Inside there was the Ark of the Covenant. The Once a year, they would make a sacrifice of bulls and calves and goats and, and sheep and different things. And that blood would be brought into the Holy of Holies. And the high priest would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. That was to atone for the sin for the whole year. What that atonement did was point toward the final high, high priest. Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12. But when Christ appears the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So, Jesus did exactly what imperfect people and the blood of animals could not do for eternity. And God showed us that he has great grace by allowing the, the Levites, well, Aaron and the Levites, to continue, continue to be a foreshadowing 
of him. Now lastly, I'll point your attention to the front left. You'll see there's a ship. I believe this glass is to represent the New Testament. Here we have a ship that has a mast and a sail. And it appears that it's in some turbulent seas. Since the early days of Christianity, the ship has been a symbol of, of the Christian church. If you look on the mast and the yard arm, they, they form a cross. And if you look closely, the cross is red, representing the blood of Jesus Christ. The cells, they're filled with wind. What does the wind represent in Scripture? The Holy Spirit. So the ship is powered by the Holy Spirit under the cross of Christ. If you'll notice on the mass, there's two symbols. Okay? Those are the Greek letters, chi and rho. The X-looking letter is chi, and the P-looking letter is is Rho. Those are the first two letters of the Greek word Christos, which means anointed one, Messiah. English, it's Christ. So those symbols back in like the 4th century AD used to represent Christ during Emperor Constantine's um, reign. According to historians, uh, he used to put that symbol on the shields of his soldiers for protection. So that was the Cairo. Also, if you look, again, I'll mention that the ship appears to be in rough seas. This, the waves symbolize difficulties and troubles on this earth. So the Christian church, under the cross of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, carries the faithful across the troubled seas of this life into heaven. So it's a pretty cool picture. And also, the ship really is a central theme of the New Testament because the Apostle Paul went on many missionary journeys and he took a lot of ships to get there. So a lot of the New Testament is written because of those missionary journeys that Paul took. You know, the Apostle Paul risked life, liberty, and, you know, his well-being to spread the gospel. Second Corinthians 11.25 says, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was drift at sea. But he still carried on faithfully. Despite all the troubles, all the persecution, he kept moving forward. He kept preaching the gospel. He relentlessly preached the gospel. In the face of death, he preached the gospel. Paul says this in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You know, Paul may have been shipwrecked many times, but, you know, physically, but spiritually, his ship carried him along right where God wanted him. There's a story in the uh, New Testament in Acts, look at Acts, when he's on his way to Rome, his ship becomes shipwrecked and he comes onto the island of Malta. He's there for like three months. You might think of it as an accident, but it wasn't. It was God's plan because he witnessed to the Maltans as they got him prepared to go on his final journey to Rome. Eventually, Paul was, you know, uh, martyred, as church history tells us. And but we know that where he is. The ship eventually carried him safely to heaven. May we all board that ship. And that kind of wraps things up. You know, a final thought. I believe that, you know, a heavy focus of our worship on exalting God and preaching word will lead to the most important message. And that is the gospel. Because it is the saving power. The good news of salvation. So, would you bow with me as we pray? Dear God, just come before you and praise you and thank you for, for your word. 
thank you so much for salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to the earth and, and dying for us. God, I just ask that if there's anybody in here that needs to know you, that you would work on their heart, draw them to you, Lord. God, if there's anybody in here that needs just to rededicate their life to you, I just ask that you would do that. God, um, we just are so blessed to be here in your church, in your word. Lord, I just ask you to bless these people as they go back out in the world. Allow them to just be able to have peace. Give them opportunities to tell people about you. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.